welcome to the Mind Chimp Podcast. Alice, welcome to the Mind Chimp Podcast. How are we doing? Hi, Danny. Really well. Thanks for having me. How how are you feeling in this kind of COVID world? How am I feeling? Um, a bit better now than I was before. I think that things kind of feel more normal now. Um, I've got into my new routine, um, so that's really good. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm feeling quite I'm feeling good. I, I've said before I am quite a glass half full kind of person, so I always look for the positives and things. Um, but I can't say that I haven't whinged and, and moaned <laughs> in the last few weeks. And I really, I am missing people and I'm kind of itching to go and catch up with people again. Like I was talking to some people from work the other day and I just thought I'm going to get so emotional. I can actually like hug people again. I'm really looking forward to that. But um, I mean, I've, I've got it pretty good. Like, you know, I'm, I can, I'm able to work from home. Super lucky. I'm in a really good position. So I really, I can't complain too much. Okay, cool. I mean, Obviously, you can see me right now. I think the two yeah. things I'm missing out on really is a gym and a haircut. Like, I look, <laughs> I look like one of the Waltons. It's shocking, <laughs> shocking. So, so Alice, before we, we get into this, um, I need you to pick for me six numbers, please, from one to 100. Okay, eight. Okay. 15. Yep. 18. 18. 23. 23. 45. 45. And 70. Perfect. We'll come back to these a little bit later on. So, Alice, before we, we, we jump into these questions, I usually ask my guests to kind of give me a bit of a log line of what summarizes them. Do you know what yours is? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've landed on um, hoping to inspire with simplicity and curiosity. Okay, so hoping to inspire with simplicity and curiosity. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> How do you feel about that one? <laughs> I like it. I think that's cool. I think, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to tell you what I think of it, and we're going to come on to that in a little bit later on. <laughs> so when you was in school, and the, the teacher used to say to Alice, what do you want to be when you grow up? What did you used to say? I think I wanted to be um, something like like a vet. There's, lo- there's lots of pictures of like me with my little like um, like nurses things and all of that. I don't know what you would call it, but it was almost like a little red kind of little, like a little lunchbox style thing, but it had like a stethoscope in it and all that kind of stuff, all like your, your medical things. So I wanted, to, I think I wanted to go in that direction. And then I always loved animals. I always liked to think that I had like an affinity with them. So I kind of wanted to be a vet. So I think that's where I wanted to go, but I never really um pursued that I think I think it it, cha- it changed you could if you asked me in primary school I probably would have said that and then I think as you kind of go up into maybe early years of secondary school it would have been like I want to do something in drama or be in the theatre or something like that and then as you get a bit older and you get more realistic that that sort of changes as well but um and I think my interests change too and it, it's like with learning and development I don't think I didn't choose to go into it. I don't think anyone chooses to go into L and D. You just kind of fall into it. Um, and I kind of, as I got to my later stages at, at school, I got more and more interested in things. I don't know what was really popular at the time was um, CSI. I don't know if you, ever, you remember that program. <laughs> yes, I did CSI at uni. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so I think we chatted about this before because I did criminology at uni. Yes. So, um, yeah, so, and that was kind of where I ended up. Um, but yeah, so, but it, that, it turned out it wasn't for me, but I ended up in L&D. I mean, yeah, like L&D is probably better anyway, right? And of course, yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> do have nightmares. Well, <laughs> you might have some nightmares. But <laughs> so, so obviously, as we know each other for, for probably, what, probably a couple of years now, I'd say. Maybe a year, yeah. two years. Um, but obviously some of the listeners might not know who you are. So maybe you could give us a bit of a whistle stop tour to kind of say, you know, who you are, where you've come from to kind of where you are right now, I guess. Okay, who am I? Um, so where do I start? So I start from, from I guess, going up from, from my first sort of roles. I've really, I've really worked my way up kind of through the ranks and started off as a, a coordinator um, in those kind of administrator coordinator roles. And I've, I've, I've always gone into quite big organisations. So I started off with 
Surrey Police because I was excited about moving into criminology. Um, but then when I kind of, I sort of started off in an L&D role and then moved over to working there, seemed a crime unit and didn't enjoy it. So went back, fell back into L&D. And I, at that point, moved over to um, uh, the Prince's Trust, which in itself was quite a big name. Um, and then it was there that I got really into um, the kind of whole world of L&D. But my, exci my excitement kind of didn't start really until I moved over to ASOS. And the reason I went over there was because uh, I got on with really well with my manager at, at um, the Prince's Trust. And she moved over to ASOS and we were apart for maybe like a year or so. And then she contacted me and said, I've got a role over at ASOS. So do you fancy going for it? So I did. And it was there that I really got into the like digital side of things. So I think if you're to see me now, you would put me into that kind of box. So you would say like, this is someone that's really into using digital for learning and, and all kind of more of these, I uh, guess, more modern practices and trying to, always update what we're doing and stay on top of that kind of stuff. So I think if I was to describe to you who I am, I'd be one of those people that is trying to get involved in all those conversations. You'll probably see me pop up in uh, lots of different talks and conferences, not, not at the moment doing the talking myself, which I'd like to start doing, but more just kind of absorbing from everyone else and um, always being like really eager to kind of chat to you about stuff. So you probably see me pop up on, on uh, LinkedIn and things like that, but I'm, I think I'm just I'm that person that really likes the idea of how we can use digital and learning and how we can make things a bit more like I said in my log in my log line um just a bit more simple kind of like strip shipping back the noise and being a bit more kind of bringing common sense into learning I guess okay so so there's quite a bit I want to jump into it there so yeah. but maybe we should start in the log line so you mentioned about kind of hoping to inspire by bringing simplicity and curiosity. So, so yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe break that down a little bit for me, please. Like why, yeah. why simplicity, curiosity, and actually why inspire? Yeah. I th I would really like people to, to listen to the things that I say and do and think that makes a lot of sense. Like, why are we not doing it this yeah. way? <laughs> Cause I love having those moments when I listen to other people. And um, so I think that's where I'm coming from with the hoping to inspire piece. I hope that, you know, one day I'll be able to kind of share what I'm doing in the room and then them think, oh, yeah, let, let's give that a go. Um, and I think the simplicity and curiosity pieces are, I'm all, like I said, I'm, I'm really curious and I'm always wanting to chat to people. And I think that's really how I've got to where I am today is because of those conversations, just being curious and exploring and asking people and just forcing people to talk to me. Um, so that's the curiosity piece. And I'll never stop being curious because I think otherwise we'll just be in the same spot and not kind of exploring things or seeing how we can improve what we're doing. So I think you have to be curious in our industry. Um, otherwise you just kind of get sort of stuck in the rut. Um, and I think the simplicity side of things is the side that I'm really passionate about because I think there's a real tendency in, in L and D to overcomplicate things. And when you can just really strip it back, and just speak to your learners or speak to the audience you're trying to connect with and help and just ask them like what are the challenges that you're actually experiencing and uh and and I think have those conversations with people rather than trying to like make these sort of elaborate programs or because I've, I've made those mistakes in the past where you kind of put on loads of different events or like training and you think this is going to be really great and this is going to really show off L&D, but it's actually not solving anything. So I just want to try and strip that back and focus on the simple things and how you could really bring yourself into being like a crucial part of an organization if you focus on the right things. And I think that's where I'm coming from with the simplicity piece. So so for me, that the two which you picked out were near and dear to me as well, I guess. Same as you, really. The simplicity is we have this uh, we have this tendency to over engineer something what really doesn't need to be, and then the curiosity is the same, right? Like, I I think back whenever you whenever you sit down with a, with a kid and like always asking why, always asking why, and it's like, I think throughout school, and I say and I, this is no disrespect to schools, but I think over time you kind of get not that knocked out of you like stop asking why and just get on with it and then mm -hmm. what that means is the output of school and the output of uni and wherever else maybe not uni too much but school is it's like an annoyance 
like asking why is it annoyance and then we just end up later on down the line with just lots of people just nodding like a church or a dog saying yeah <laughs> and, and actually never really questioning it. why are we even doing that like what is the point why are we doing that like why are we doing not why are we not changing this and doing it a better way what will give us better results so i think the two which it's out there were really really cool actually well done i like that i like that a lot <laughs> thanks i think that's it's true um we should always be asking why are we doing this and and I, sometimes i think i can be the annoying person in an organization because i'm always asking why and i'm always just sort of saying you know well let's think about what we're trying to achieve with this and it must be really annoying for people when they sort of come to us and say that you know i we've got this idea that we need to kind of put on this training and I'll just make them put the brakes on and make them challenge it and question it. And that must be so irritating, but I I don't know who it was, but I have heard someone say before on a podcast I listened to, it's like, you wouldn't be doing your job right if you weren't annoying people. So (laughs) that makes me feel comforted, I guess. Yeah. And and it's an interesting one. I think even when you put stuff out on LinkedIn or whatever else, like you have to be prepared to to be, you're going to probably piss off a certain percentage of people and you're going to inspire a certain percentage and some people are just going to sit on the fence and just be like and it's noise or whatever but Mm -hmm. I think if you're not saying something which doesn't you know wind people up and doesn't make them annoyed then you're not really probably saying anything of interest to a certain point Mm -hmm. like you need to be a little bit provocative with that but Mm -hmm. I kind of want to jump to to ASOS so correct me if I'm wrong but this is where you met Adam right our mutual friend Adam so yeah. yeah tell me about asos and adam and, and all that world uh yeah sure so yeah I, I joined that um and my role was to think about how we could use digital and learning and i think like he was he was already already kind of doing this but i think what they were looking for me at the time was to somehow improve face-to-face experiences with technology and i, I think that was the idea of the role um, and I, well, was quite, I think my, one of my legacies at ASOS was I walked in and then one of the first things they did was they asked me to create a, a presentation on what we could do to improve some of the stuff that we're, we're offering. And I, I think my presentation is like something ridiculous, like 40 slides long. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was like, right, well, we're going to have to, you know, schedule in more time. It just went on and on and on because at the time, I think I was just so excited about all of this stuff that people were using in real life, um, all the technology that people were using, and I was excited about bringing that into learning. And I think that it was my my ideas were like really at the infancy stage there. I think it was all this stuff, not not necessarily AI, but like things like QR codes and all those kind of things were were quite exciting. So that was where I was at, and then. It's where I met Adam and he sort of pulled like pulled me to the side and we got chatting and I think from the very moment like we first met, we kind of knew that we were both like quite passionate people and I think I was really lucky lucky because he saw something in me and he um kind of took me under his wing, which was really nice. And he taught me all the things that he was doing right at that moment in time. And he was really one of the first people to um I guess be involved in these types of conversations and was the, one of the first people to really start to push learning into the direction that's going now. And he was on some podcasts and he was starting to do, you know, some right people were writing articles about some of the stuff that he was um, doing. And, and so he was quite inspiring for me. And I think it was, I was really lucky that someone was able to recognize that in me and, and kind of push me and say like, you're on the right track and you know, you believe in the right thing. So like, let's just nurture this. So I think, I owe a lot to him because um, yeah, he really introduced me to this world and and um, introduced me to a lot of great people, including yourself. So uh, and helped me to really build up my network. And I think everyone needs to meet someone like that at some point in their career that kind of says, like, this is where I see your strengths in, and and here, here's I'm just going to push you into the right direction. So I'm, I'm so lucky to do that. And and we got involved in lots of great stuff together at ASOS. So we we um, started to explore how we can improve onboarding and and manager training through kind of this idea of resources first. So it completely changed the way that we we had previously done stuff um, at ASOS. And I think it, you know, it really kind of shaped how I look at stuff now. Um, And I mean, obviously I've kind of grown and and developed since then and moved on to another organization, but 
yeah, I think just I learned a lot of lessons from the kind of things that we were doing at ASOS. And it was really like my introduction to how you can use digital, but how you can use it in the right ways. And I think there was that kind of honing in on that passion to make it really useful. That's cool. And it, and it, I guess for me, just listening to you there, it's you highlighted a really good point. Like you could have easily gone into a company like ASOS and then, you know, we brought you in for a reason. Maybe it's for your creativity or where you look at things or how you problem solve or whatever else. Mm-hmm. And they could have easily just dropped you in and you could have disappeared within the organization, right? Like mm-hmm. I've seen it time and time again. They go, we want you to be this role. And then when you get you in like, but it's got to all be face to face and it's got to all be this. And you're like, well, you've kind of already got all that stuff and that's not working. So it's yeah. good to hear that, you know, especially in the, in the early stages of ASOS when you was in there, is having someone like Adam. And it's really nice. Yeah. But... yeah. Oh, sorry, my dog's barking. Um, okay. <laughs> one second. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Sorry. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, it, and that it, it, it could have happened and I was lucky that it, it didn't. But I think what the danger for me was that um where I start I I am quite creative and I think where I wanted to bring value to stuff was that I would um have a look at some of the the things that we had going on and people would come to me and say how can we make this a really great experience and I would kind of use my creativity to help with that and then I kind of got put in a box at a a couple of stages where um it was like oh Mm. you know we we've got um instructions from above that we need to put this event on and I kind of just got dragged into those projects at times and I would just have to be like you know the creative brain behind it and I think there was always this like niggling thing for me that I wanted I wanted to question it and challenge it but at at that stage I couldn't um so it was like a real learning curve for me and I think probably lots of people at that time in the industry were feeling the same way that like we you know, we have a job, we had a job to do and we had to try and find these way, these ways of, of putting on this stuff because we, you know, we had to fulfill that job. Um, and I think there were, now it's kind of changed a little bit, but at the time it's like, how can we start to like branch out from that? And how can we just start to make these more valuable? And I think that was the question that we were kind of asking ourselves. So it's like, it's been the journey since then. Okay, cool. So, so moving from ASOS, You've um you moved on to Monzo, which I was down there. I think probably what well, it seems like four months ago now. Don't well, it's got yeah. a bit longer than that. What six six months ago? <laughs> um, and it's and it's awesome. Like when I went and I was like, oh, this is cool. This is cool. And then I think we had a cup of tea and stuff. But yeah, tell us maybe a little bit about about Monzo because I only got a little snapshot of it. But obviously you've been there for a bit now. Yeah, so yeah, so, maybe tell us a little um, bit about your role there yeah, and what so you're doing there. Monzo, um, I've been super lucky to um land at Monzo, and uh. So I think the first thing to highlight about it is that I went into a part of something called a people product team. So it's not a standard or traditional learning development team. Um, and so that, what that means is that okay. I was in uh, a team with engineers um, and, and, and with um, kind of data and analytics experts too. So whereas in a normal L&D team, you'll probably find that you've got um, – you know, some partners that are there to kind of help find solutions for the business and stuff like that. And I think if it's as a digital kind of professional, you'll be in those teams and you'll be like, right, I want to do all these great things, but I have to try and find someone in, in the technology department um, that will help me to engineer this. And I want to get my head around analytics, but I haven't got the expertise in my team to do it. And our analytics team are really busy, so they can't help. So I think you have all of these challenges, but being part of the people product team immediately meant that people were at my fingertips like straight away. So the conversations that I was having with vendors and, um, you know, when I was trying to get my head around bringing in digital solutions, the engineers were in the conversations from the start. So it was like, you know, once we'd established what the challenges were in the business and what technology we needed, I then had my engineers to say, okay, well, this is what you need to make that work seamlessly as a, as a, a people product with all of the other products that we're using. So I was so lucky that that happened. Um, so it's really different to anything I've experienced before. And also I think there's, um, it's a different style of working at Monzo. So it's a, obviously a tech company. And that means that um, 
you know, the language is quite different. So it took me a while to get my head around that. Some of the terminology, a lot of the time I was just sat in meetings, just like nodding. <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> um, but the ways of working are very different. It's a lot, I, I think, in tech in general is more efficient. And I think it's, you know, the sprint style of working. Um, and I think there's a lot more documentation involved. Um, and I, I just think that is really refreshing because there can be a lot of noise in L and D and when you're trying to sort of find a focus can be really difficult. So to actually have outputs can be difficult because you're trying to tackle so many different things. So, um, I think it's been really useful to be a part of, of this type of organization and this team, because it's just taught me so much. So it's, it's enabled me to take all of those great things that I learned at ASOS through Adam and through the stuff that we did and just elevate it to a whole new level because I'm learning from the people around me. That's cool. That's really cool. I think it's um it's an interesting one. And a while back, I talked about kind of this backstage L and D, and and that's exactly what it is, right? Like L and D doesn't need to be the front and center of stage. Like we don't need to be that person going blah blah blah. We just need to understand our people, the journeys, and the touch points within their journeys, and what that looks like. And I think you you kind of already on that journey, right? With, yeah. with Monzo, we're kind of way ahead. So that's awesome. So. So I guess these next couple of questions then is more about okay. you, but feel free to take them wherever you want to go, Alice. So I guess the first question is actually, you know, we've talked about your success so far with ASOS and Monzo and, and obviously whatever else is going to be coming next is going to be a great success a picture. But actually, you know, when we go for a job and we have to, we have to do that, right? We have to tell them all about our good stuff. But I think we find out more about people when, when we ask them what their failure CV looks like. So what failure, and maybe it's, maybe it's just, yeah, what, what failure jumps out to you? Like yeah. what's the one that um, really springs to mind? So I think um, early, like early doors, um, I didn't challenge enough, but I think we all kind of were in that stage. Um, I, I think maybe sort of, I guess one of the big things that I touched on earlier was kind of I think breaking out this idea of like what being creative is in like it's like what's creative and what's like kind of innovative and where I got sort of put in this in this box of like being the creative person and it was like actually what does that mean in L&D and how can you actually use that to be really like beneficial and bring something to the team and help move it forward so I think I, I wish that I had kind of branched that out a little bit earlier and sort of and taken my kind of creativity label and said okay well let's just look at how we can work as a team and kind of be a bit more innovative and a bit more challenging and um and I think maybe not necessarily a failure I think that's more of like a learning curve for me and I I now know how to do that a bit more um so that was interesting and I think uh, one of the things that really jumps out at me is previously, because I always wanted to get into these, like speaking on podcasts and going out and speaking at events, and I'm not, I'm not there yet. I'm still sort of working my way up and um, just making sure I'm talking to the right people and I'm also trying to find like, I guess, experiences so I've got valuable things to share. But I think when I started off, I, um, I had to like when you're doing stuff like this, I think you have to make sure that you're, if you're representing an organization, you have to kind of get the right permissions and stuff like that. And there was one that I, I, mm. so I signed up to do something. Yeah, I'm really excited. But then I had to back out of it because the organization I worked for at the time, like um, basically like kind of said, well, it's not the right time. So I had to let someone down. And I think that was like, that was a bit upsetting for me because it felt like a real knockback. Cause I was like, I really wanted to do this. Um, and it yeah. just didn't happen, but it didn't, it didn't change anything. And like, I managed to do it eventually in the end, like we did it another time, but it's just kind of like, at the time I was just really like hyped up and excited to do my first one and I couldn't do it. And yeah, I think that for, for me, the lesson I learned was make sure that you're speaking to the right people before you kind of jump up like feet first into this kind of stuff. Cause you know, you've got to <laughs> make sure you're like making the right decisions and doing the right thing. So so I would disagree with you. So I, whenever we have a chat, I always get something out of our conversations. Like, I think I think what you say is has merit. Like, it's interesting. Like, 
you know what you say a lot of people aren't talking about so <laughs> so yeah that's good how dare you, how dare you? <laughs> so we know so we've touched upon kind of like your your failure cv but what's been your biggest and maybe um no we won't put a time frame on it but what's been your biggest most recent personal or professional success um I would say I'm like it has to be at Monzo because I think this is the first time I feel like I've really come into my own and um I guess sort of like started to pioneer like my way of doing things and I have to be careful when I say like my my way of doing things because it's not I, I got some stick for writing like this on <laughs> LinkedIn once so I've got to be careful it's like I think it, <laughs> it obviously I did a lot of the work behind that to speak to the organization and understand the challenges it had and what we needed but I think this is the first time I've been able to say okay well here's my ideas on how we can um support that and I, I think so that's kind of been my biggest success is that you know, I was able to um, kind of stand up in front of the business and say, this is how we think we can support you. And I, I did that quite recently, maybe like it was at the start of lockdown, actually, like one of the first weeks of lockdown. And I think that was like really exciting for me because it was like, it, it can be it's scary because it's like, this is all on me. So, <clears throat> you know, but I think it was really nice mm -hmm. to kind of, be that face that could stand up in front of the business and say, you know, this is the reasons why we think that this is the best way to go in terms of L and D in the business. And, um, and this is what we're doing for you. And, and going back to my log line, like this is why it should make sense. And, um, and you know, we've listened, we've spoken to you and like, we understand what your challenges are. And I think to, to do all of that kind of have all of that stuff that I've been talking to so many people about and the things that I'm really passionate about to actually translate that into a real life strategy that comes from our, like our team and to actually like spearhead that and stand up in front of the organization and share it was like a huge moment for me. So, um, and yeah, but I think once you kind of do something like that, then you've got to see it through and make it happen, which I'm hoping we're doing. But, but yeah, that was a huge success for me. <laughs> nice, nice, good work. Hey, sorry we interrupted your podcast, but we just wanted to let you know about Vendely where finding learning has developed. At Vendorly, we understand the pain points of looking for reliable vendors and securing new clients. We've created a platform to help you with this, save you time and help you flourish. We want you to be the first to see it. So head over to vendorly.co.uk and take a peek. That's Vendorly with a double N. So I guess these questions kind of, you can take them wherever you want to go with them. But there's certain questions where I'm like, no, this has got to be professional or, or personal or whatever. But um, this next one kind of, yeah, it doesn't have to be personal, professional. It can be whatever you want it to be. But if you had to give a gift of a book to five people, what, one what book. book would it be? I So this is quite easy because um, I got given a book by someone called The Originals. Um, and I can't remember exactly who it's by. I'll have to have a look. But... Um, someone gave it to me because I can get really like passionate about something and like I, I kind of I explain it sometimes a bit like a bull in a china shop and <laughs> I'll kind of just get so excited about something and and what happened was my message was getting lost and I was losing people and I think that book really taught me to um, help to pull people along the journey with you and it was a really interesting read and it had it was just had so many great lessons in it I think one of them was which I shared with my husband because he's a musician and um one of the lessons in it was um about people like an example of someone like John Legend who um he basically did you know that he was uh okay. a, some kind of like um like consultant or like project manager um, before he became a famous musician and the whole lesson behind it was like these people have like backup plans and um, you know they've always got something kind of like on the side that they were working on um, before they kind of made it in their dream project and it was just like it really put things into perspective and I remember sharing that with 
Ben and I was just like, you know, like these people had like these really boring in inverted commas <laughs> side jobs. Um and whilst they worked on their passion projects and it was just I found that like really interesting because you, you look at these people and you think oh you've always been talented you've always you know been able to just like do what you love and you've just become massively famous and rich off it but it's like it's not the case like everyone has to earn their way and everyone has a bit of graft at the start and I really liked that book because it just it kind of gave you that little bit of a push and all those little, little messages hidden in it but then also really practical advice that would help you to apply it so it's like actually if this is your dream if you're an original with original idea this is how you can make it happen and this is how you bring people on the journey so I loved that book I read it so quickly so I would 100% recommend it to anyone so I think I might be getting mixed up here but is is that I think I might be getting mixed up with outliers I'm not sure um but is that the one where it talks about a a company that yes that you do something with glasses that's the one (laughs) yes it is okay yeah so it's, I think yeah. it's Malcolm Gladwell, I think, I want to say. Yeah. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think I remember. When you talked to me, I was like, they, it I was know this a book. Company, the first company to it. sell glasses online, and no one thought it would happen, and that anyone would want to buy their glasses online. But it, yeah, it's all the stories about how they made that happen. And that was pretty cool. Um, kind of kind of similar to ASOS, I guess. Like, no one thought anyone would buy clothes online. No one ever thought that you'd buy wedding dresses online, and they smashed all of those. So yeah, it's another good story. Hmm. I think ASOS have done really well with that because, I mean, they have like the, the styles guidings now and the sizes and stuff, and they can kind of be getting closer to being yeah. really good at nailing your size and stuff. But it's just a little things like little videos where they show you, right? Like, yeah. Here's how it looks on someone walking <laughs> in slow motion, yeah. and here's it's, someone it's doing true. the twirl. They're always coming up with really cool things to do, and that's why I loved working there. Like, I was there, I think maybe nearly three years in the end, and it was always like the vibe was always so electric. And you just walk in the door and you're like, this is really cool. Um, I always say that it was, it was bad for your your ego at times because I'm like, what, five foot four? And then I next to these beautiful, like six foot models <laughs> walking through the front door. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> and then my um, my husband would come and meet me after work with the dog. So you've got a little puppy. And um, well, he was, she was a puppy at the time. And then I'd walk out and he would be surrounded by these six foot models all playing with a puppy. And I was just like, this this is not good um but yeah like, I, I think that's why I stayed there I think for so long because like I loved I loved my job but I think it, just being part of an organization like that where the vibe was electric you believed in it and I think that's, that has taught me that I will never work for an organization I don't believe in and I don't have that kind of passion for because I just think like it's so valuable to feel that when you walk through the door every day yeah so I guess kind of there seems to be I mean there's a common occurrence between Monzo and ASOS and kind of the scale up, to the scale, you know, the, from the start up to the kind of mid business to the wherever they are right now and whatnot. Is that kind of where you, is that, would you say, is that where you enjoy thriving? Like if you go like, say from there to say a really old hierarchy organization, like is that, is that kind of your sweet spot now then, would you say? I'd say so. Yeah. I think I'm definitely, I definitely thrive in, coming into an organization that is like you know you can see it's very clear where they want to get to and it's led by people that are like really passionate about that because I think I feed off that energy Mm. so um yeah I definitely think that is my sweet spot and I'm lucky to be part of Monzo at such an exciting time and I think I think it's being in in an L&D function at that time as well is is super exciting too because I think you you've really got kind of like artistic license to to like make a path and um sometimes I think you can go into organizations that are maybe a bit more established and it's harder for you to kind of challenge the status quo so Mm. I think when you're in maybe it's not necessarily a younger um company because I've said this before like you know I think my approach to development isn't just for young people it's more like for the way that we behave in like the modern day like it's just trying to bring learning up to that it's not necessarily aimed at a younger audience so I don't think like age comes into it but I think like it's like I, I am really excited to be part of like an L&D function at a company that is like you know at the point that Monzo's in at the moment. So 
again, this this can be wherever it takes you, I guess. But can you remember the first time you was ever in trouble? <laughs> I've got to be careful here because I can't give like a really bad example. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't, oh dear um when did I really get in trouble oh, I can't I don't know um see so, because the reality of it is is you've got one right in front of your mind now and you're not sharing it <laughs> no I can't because I was really naughty when I was younger um I'm trying to think of like a pc <laughs> that, um <laughs> all right I'll tell you the first one and then you can take it out okay <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> I I remember I was like quite young and um I sort of I kind of got into the wrong crowd at school and there was like a local park and the, they would kind of like they had markers and they would draw on the slides with their markers and um I kind of got in with that crowd and I decided to join in but what I did was I put my full initials on the slide <laughs> and then my dad with went with my little brother to the park and uh obviously saw my initials on the sign so it was like <laughs> Alice you can't be doing stuff like that so I got in a lot of trouble I got grounded for a long time from that because you know you can't be drawing on slides <laughs> um so yeah I definitely that's that's the first time I remember being really in trouble I can just put you there right your full name your address your postcode <laughs> <laughs> Take that. <laughs> the national insurance number just in advance. <laughs> yeah, but so, not the smartest move. No, oh, it's a good one though. It's a good one for sure. <laughs> so I guess, uh, and you know, this question can can be as deep or as light as you want to be, but let's just pretend you've got a billboard and you have a stadium with a million people coming out of that stadium and we're all going to see this billboard. What would you put on that billboard or what would you do with it? Does it have to be about me or it just can be anything? It can be anything you want. It can be there to inspire, to shape, to play, to be creative. Ah, Interesting. I would probably put, so it's on my, uh, it's on my link, I think, is it on my LinkedIn or... Yeah, it no, it's on my Twitter page. It's the wallpaper on my Twitter page. And it's a quote by Salvador Dali. And it says, never fear uh, perfection because you'll never reach it. Um, I think that's what it says. And I, I think I really like that. It come, I got into Salvador Dali from my first uh, sort of like quirky boyfriend who had like <laughs> Salvador Dali tattoos on him. So he introduced me to him. And I, I just, I really like that quote because, it's kind of true. Like, um, you know, don't be worried about always being perfect because I think if you're someone like me, like you'll always be pushing yourself and you'll never, you'll, you'll never reach it. So I think just be proud of like, um, what you're achieving. And I, I really think that quote kind of gets that message across. Just be like, you know, super happy with the things that you achieve and reflect on it and, um, take, take stock of that stuff and stop trying to be perfect all the time mm. and I think that kind of aligns with your your professional the professional Alice right like you know when we've had conversations it's always about good is good enough like let's move let's move faster good is good enough and it kind of sings back to you know you and your career I guess as well right like your approach to to learning and 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 performance and, and whatever else and all the stuff that you're doing right now so that's cool nice one yeah I think you yeah I think I think that's true like a lot of the stuff that we that I I do I'll never say that it's going to be a great finished product and I think it's important to remember that um and I'll I'll always look back on things and be like you know we could have done that a bit better um but I think it's important that when you're in a role like this and you're trying to do kind of what myself and lots of other people in L&D are doing in terms of trying to do something a bit different and helping people to see why this way of working is going to be beneficial and I think you have to take baby steps and you have to try and like show them how it can be positive and like you're not going to be able to please everyone um but I think if you can just kind of take those baby steps and then be like okay so we didn't nail it this time but what can we do to make it better and you're just kind of constantly learning and I think that's the way that we're going to be able to move forward because I think otherwise we'll just be too afraid to like step out of what we feel comfortable doing and so I think it's really important to to work that way so Mm. that you can keep improving really 
Cool. So, so I guess these are going to be more L and D tailored now. So, mm-hmm. and let's let's try and see how fast we can get for this one. Give me five people <laughs> in L and D that you think everybody should be following on social media. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, uh, yourself. That's Thank definitely you. one of them. <laughs> Number one. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's a really good one. I think you share some pretty great interesting stuff and some great questions on uh linkedin that everyone can get involved in which i really enjoy um i would say david james um he is a good friend of mine and i think he's got a great podcast um and he's definitely worth checking out because he has a great way of bringing people together in the industry and inspiring great conversations um adam has to be the third one because he he kind of he always manages to I don't know if he's gonna be offended with me saying this, but he puts himself in the right like he always manages to put himself in the right place at the right time. And I think like he's got such a valuable message to share and he's got a really good way of finding the right platforms to share it. So he's definitely worth a, a listen. Um there's somebody that I've been chatting to recently called Sam Allen, I think his name is, and I hope I've got that right. Um so he um, has been inspiring some really interesting chats recently on LinkedIn. Um, and so that's definitely worth a, a check out. So how many is that? Four? That's four. Oh, the fifth one. Um, so really the fifth one should... Oh, so I think it may be on the social media, but I've had some really great chats with Nigel Payne um and he's um you know we've had coffees together and stuff and always and he shared some really interesting um articles and things with me so yeah i think he's definitely worth checking out too okay um yeah cool cool thank you so so i guess we talked about social media and and i guess this is gonna be a two-part question really but one what what's your take on l and d and social media, L&D's presence on social media. And and I guess, yeah, like, I'm kind of waiting it to see what you think, but, you know, positive, negative, you know, in the middle, whatever. Like, what's your take on it? Um, I think it's really positive at the moment. Like, um, I don't know how, when it started. Maybe, like, in the last over the last couple of years, I feel like, especially on LinkedIn, the conversations have just started booming. So I think it's positive at the moment. Um, like you were saying earlier, you do, you, can't, you do get challenged by people, so you have to be prepared for that. Like if you want to put out a, uh, a blog or something, you will get people coming back to you and saying, actually, I don't agree with that. So you need to be ready for that. And I think, um, but I think it's quite respectful at the moment, which is great. Obviously, that Twitter is a good place as well. Like I think it's quite positive on there. Lots of people are sharing, which is is great. Um, I don't think it's like as experimental as other industries. And so I've been trying to I've been trying to think about how I could do this recently. Like, what can we do with something like Instagram? Like to kind of make what we do a little bit more interesting because I feel like everyone is like um taking their industry no matter what it is or their job and they'll start they're sharing it on Instagram and I need to get my head around that it's like it's not boring like we do some really interesting exciting things so how could we share that and actually people be interested in it like so I think that there are areas that we could get better I think we're just starting at the moment Cool. I will share with you some of the stuff I've done on LinkedIn on a lockdown thing as a pilot. That's not a pilot because that's an old school term, but it was an experiment. Um, and I give myself like three or four months with a couple of other people. So it is some cool stuff for sure. So that's really yeah. exciting. And we'll talk about it a little bit later on. But cool. I guess kind of where do you see L&D going? Like in one respect, you can turn around and say, well, L&D stays the same, right? Like, I reckon we could go back in time, five years, ten years, and the conversation's still the same. So what, what is L&D's problem 
it's probably the best way to phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> and is it a problem? Like, <laughs> it's your take, right? Is it a problem? <laughs> um, what is L&D's problem? I think there is still, like, that little bit of reluctance to... Like, we're challenging, but it's hard to kind of get ourselves out of what we're so used to doing still. And I think sometimes that's the challenge. Um, and I think maybe because like, I guess you have to sort of, it's an element of like, you have to seek to believe it and you have to kind of see the positives of this whole idea of like, for example, some of the stuff that I'm working on, like thinking more performance support, thinking more resource first, taking away, like, um, putting things out there just for the sake of it. I think there is still kind of this idea of like, oh my gosh, there's a there's a gap. Like we need management training quick. Let's put some resources or let's put some training out there that's like focused on the things around management training that we know are like tried and tested things that a manager needs. It's like actually let's take a step back and put our energy into understanding like where the gaps are and what specifically like what do we want from a great manager in this organization and where are the gaps between like what we currently have and where we want to be and actually understanding what the real challenges are and I think that takes a lot of energy whereas I think our energy at the moment is quite often put into right let's source that kind of immediate fix let's plug that gap let's like put plaster over it um, and then we we please the people that are asking for this training. So that's where our energy goes. And and then so it's, that's what I mean about there being a lot of noise because we're constantly putting those plasters over things. Whereas I think what we need to start doing is challenging ourselves to put our energy into understanding what the real challenges are, what's the real blockers. So I guess this idea of like peak performance, whether you're looking at what's a, what's a peak performing manager, and I, I think there's a reluctance in a way if I'm honest, for, for people to do that. And I think we, unless we have like that bravery to kind of stop and say, okay, I'm aware that we've got this challenge. Like here's how I would suggest that we kind of can step back and really understand how we're having an impact and how we're going to measure that. And then I think, because the, the thing for me is that I think other industries have been doing this for a really long time and we haven't, taking that step over to it that's like we're taking we're starting to move there now but like other industries you know if you think of like people that I work with like engineers if they're building a product they would never build something unless they kind of knew how it was going to enrich their users lives so it's like why are we building things without that knowledge and I think like that's where we need to start growing as, a, as an, an industry and I think we're starting to but I think we need to keep learning those lessons from industries that have been doing this for years, like engineers, like marketing teams and stuff like that. And just, yeah, I think there's gaps that we need to, we need to develop in ourselves because we're not getting it right yet. We're on the right track, but I think we could really bring ourselves into the center of businesses. If we just asked those questions and challenged and took a step back, I think that's how we could do it. So that's where I see us. If, and I do think we'll get there. I just think I think that word bravery is like huge because it it takes a lot to be that person in an organization that annoying person like me to mm. say like we can't we're not gonna do it that way we're gonna put our energy into really understanding this challenge and doing the right things rather than doing things fast and I think that's the challenge I think um I think you're spot on like you know a while back probably two years ago now I was talking about how you the future L&D team, and this is a bold statement, like future L&D team doesn't need L&D people in it. Like yeah. it's a bold statement. And I remember I got some flack in it and I kind of said, <laughs> here, these people are better at doing this than what we are to them. Mm. And I kind of started to break it down. And and it's an interesting one because it, I think products, you know, product designers, service designers, the, these have all been doing this stuff for, for ages. And um, and I think one of the things which, for me, I think it's not to say it's not there, but we, we L&D 
always a playing and fixing the downstream and never really looking at the upstream. And rather than going, oh, here, let's be reactive. And we don't very rarely go, right, okay, let me step back and let me have a look systemically what is actually causing this. Like, because we're constantly putting fires out down here and I know that's a, a term that's always used, but we're never really looking up to say what's actually causing the fire. So, and it's, it's, it's simple little things, right? Like if there's a fire there, put a fire extinguisher there or uh, I'll, I'll just stop the fire from ever happening. And, um, mm-hmm. and I think, and and this is kind of why I think sometimes you get kind of this very polarized voice on, 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 on kind of social media and stuff, because certain people like there's certain people who have these ideas and don't talk about them and then there's certain people who talk about them and you know they're doing it and stuff and it's interesting because you hear people complain like it's always the same voices well fine i agree with that it is always the same voices but it's up to you not not you alice but it's up to you to kind of add value to that and and be that other voice what's needed and 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 I think we we don't see that all the time in our industry. Sometimes we see people who have these great ideas, but we don't be shy away from sharing or well, not sharing, yeah. but we shy away from kind of putting yourself out there. Like whenever I put a post out on LinkedIn or whatever, I am ready to get levered. <laughs> like I'm ready to get slapped <laughs> and I'm ready. And, I'm, and and to some extent, I think people should do that. Like I should be proved wrong as much as I'm proved right. Or I should be able to go, you know what? Didn't really think about that. Thanks for highlighting it. Let me go and have a think. And um, but I think we see less of that. And I think what you get is you get this bit of a you get a bit of a mob mentality of people who mm-hmm. don't like. There's a quote which I have on my phone here, and it's um, if anyone can refute me, show me, and admit that I'm making a mistake or looking at things from a wrong perspective, and I'll gladly change if it's the truth that I'm after. And I think that's so true because. If I'm wrong, then show me. But realistically, yeah. if you're not showing me or you're not, or you're doing it on the download, then how is our industry ever going to kind of constantly rise? So it's spot yeah. on what you're saying. Like these industries who have been doing this for years, the design industry is it's probably one which I align to more than learning now and I probably have done for a while. Yeah. They're a great example of that. So it's, yeah. it's a good it's a good shout. Yeah, a good shout. yeah I think you're right. And I think that's, to, yeah, something I've, definitely appreciated about being in this team and I think <clears throat> the people I have around me as well in my like so there's two other people that make up kind of the what we call like people development in in Bonzo and they like we have we're really open and we do challenge each other and I often say like I, I think that's so valuable and I always call it out I always say like I really appreciate having you here because you're challenging me to think in a different way and I appreciate that because I think you know although I feel quite passionately about what I'm doing and I believe in a certain way of doing stuff it's you need someone around you to say have you thought about this though and otherwise mm-hmm. you'll just be blinkered so I think you definitely need people around you that will will challenge you it's important you've got them yeah cool sure. so Alice being mindful of your time here I'm gonna ask you three quick <laughs> questions Question one, where can people find out a little bit more about you? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think LinkedIn is the best place to go at the moment. Um, so I've been trying to share as much as possible um, on there. So yeah, jump on my LinkedIn page uh, and you'll find some blogs and some bits that I've been up to as well. Cool. Okay, right at the start, I asked you what you want to be when you grow up and you said, you know, you used to tell the teacher of that, but... Alice, as you know, we never really truly stopped growing up. So if I was to ask you now, Alice, what do you want to be now when you grow up? What would you say now? Uh, um, what would I like to be? How 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 up are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> let's say, let's say, let's say, what do you want to be in the next five years? In the next five years, I would love to be, um, I'd love to be it, like leading a team that are doing some great stuff um you know I think I can't say like where I'll be because you know I don't know exactly but I think the type of role I would really like to be you know nurturing and leading a team um with loads of great experience and some successes behind me um and I'd love to be standing up at um things like learning technologies and um all of these like other great conferences or talks that happen and just sharing my experiences and for people to go that makes a lot of sense we're gonna try it 
um, that's where I want to be in five years. Cool, cool. So right at the start, I should pick six numbers. So you're on a desert island and these numbers retaliate to something on my list. So have you, are you ready for these six <laughs> items on this list that you picked? Yeah. So you've got a slipper, a rubber <laughs> yeah. duck, um, a model car, a picture frame, a piece of cardboard, and a seatbelt. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone's <laughs> ever picked a seatbelt, so well done there. <laughs> so tell me, Alice, what are you doing with these six items on a desert island? Oh, my goodness. Well, okay. Let's see. I've got a rubber duck. I'm going to write them down. So I've got a rubber duck. A rubber duck, a slipper. Yeah. A model car. Okay. A picture frame. Yeah. A piece of cardboard. And okay. a seatbelt. And a seatbelt. Well, I can't build anything to get off the desert island, so I guess I'm going to stay where I am. Um, what should I do? I guess, like, I, the immediately, like, my rubber duck is, like, it's obviously good. Am I on my own? Because then, am I on my own? Yes. So the rubber duck, I think, is going to be, like, my Wilson. He's going to be my friend. Um, so we've got Wilson sorted. Um, I think... It's so funny because like, when you're saying these things to me, I immediately thought, what do they remind me of? So I think they would kind of form like a bit of a memory box. I don't think I can do much of this stuff. I'm not very creative in terms of building things. Okay. So um, I think I probably like, yeah, these can all be my memories because the slipper immediately made me think of my job because if you say, if you tell her to go and fetch, fetch your slippers, she'll go get your slippers, which is really cute. Nice. Um, so she would that would remind me of her. I think uh, <laughs> the the model car would remind me of my dad because he he is a mechanic and he um like he's always he, you know he's taken me to places like Brands Hatch before and tried to get me into cars quite successfully. So that model car reminds me of my dad. Um, and the picture frame and cardboard maybe I could like use that to create some kind of like artwork that will cheer me up so you'll <laughs> create that out of the picture frame and cardboard and then I guess the seatbelt can maybe be my like I've moved away from my memory box and my seatbelt can be my uh like maybe my hunting method okay. <laughs> I'm gonna like I'm gonna like whip things <laughs> I do with a tea towel <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll do. That's, so I won't start because I've got my uh, whipping hunting technique. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, Alice, is he, is he, last question, is there anything what I haven't asked you what you want me to ask? Um... Nothing. No, I think I think you've asked some really great questions. I don't think there's anything else. Um, no. Perfect. Well, Alice, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Bye bye.